Um, so we're pleased tonight to um, have you, uh, John. Uh, thanks for coming to uh, to this event. Um, we're a bit late, so I'm gonna uh, skip all the the nice part and uh, let you begin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexis. Hi guys, uh, my name is John Demaros. I work for Kickstarter, and it is a sincere pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, thank you, first of all, to Uzine for hosting, for Hardware Club for organizing, and I want to be very, very clear about something. I am here because in the next few months, Kickstarter is opening up to French creators. We are very excited about this. We think it's the coolest thing in the world. I've had the pleasure of working with a lot of really interesting, cool, innovative campaigns over the last few months. And uh, a lot of those like are actually here represented today. So I sketch note, 3D Sound Labs, print, all fantastic creators. So uh, you know, this is something that we've been waiting for and looking forward to for a long time. Are we cool? Yeah, we are. OK. So, this is me. Uh, I head up the tech and design uh, categories with uh, two great colleagues. There's three of us, me, Nick, and Julio. And this is the fundamental premise that drives everything on our site. We exist as a platform for people to create and share things with other people. Okay. Oh, it's going backwards. Now it's going forward. I think I got it. OK, so people create wonderful, amazing creative projects in 15 different categories. There's a lot of diversity on our site. And you can tell we have categories that range from the arts all the way to theater. Again, I specialize in design and tech. Uh, but fundamentally, you can create projects on our site uh, from in any of these 15 categories. It's been uh, quite an um, oh, OK, one second. I'm going to. Do this a little bit from here. Since we started, we've had $1.6 billion pledged to over 80,000 projects, which has been an astounding experience to see happen. Um, this amounts to uh, over 8.2 million people pledging towards projects. And it's a community that keeps returning. 2.4 million people have pledged to more than one project. And a number that's not here, 250,000 people on our site have pledged to more than 10 projects. And a lot of those people tend to come back and look for like really interesting, cool, and innovating projects in the, in the tech and design categories. I got it. I figured it out. OK. Um, again, relating to a lot of those backers on our site, what you see is uh, you see a lot of our backers are people that have backed more than one project. 60% uh, of our backers uh, keep coming back to our site. Uh, and you know what, it represents backers from every single country in the world, including even Antarctica. Uh, and we've had. We're very proud of this. We've had quite an impact on the commons, on the culture in the world. And I'd like to show you guys a few projects that we feel have significantly impacted uh, the technology world. So if you guys are familiar with Oculus Rift, the head-mounted VR display, it exploded on our site and in the process created an entire industry. Uh, we've had projects on our site that relate to VR that are sensors, that are handheld modules, that allow you to run in place and experience the VR space. An entire ecosystem of companies have risen up uh, after Oculus Rift on our site. Another great project was the uh, 3Doodler, the world's first 3D printing pen. So you take a 3D printer, and then you take the extruder, and you put it in your hand. And you allow yourself to doodle objects out of nothing into thin air. Really, really playful system. And one of, a great little story about these guys, they had been working on it for years, and they couldn't find enough traction in, in, in large corporations that do this sort of thing. So they brought it to Kickstarter, and ended up, ended up raising uh, over $2 million on the first campaign. And on their second campaign this January, over a million dollars again. And of course, Pono, a music player uh, uh, brought to life by Neil Young with the help of over 18,000 people. Um, Neil Young, what did he really want as a musician? He just wanted to listen to music that he felt like really represented what it should sound like. And it turns out there were 18,000 people in the world that felt the same way. 
Electric Objects is a great project out of New York that's uh, creating a new way to display art in your home. Uh, they raised over $700,000 on our site, and they're really working hard on making art as accessible in your home as you find it in galleries and museums. So I'm going to talk a little bit of how it works. Just a quick pause here. How many people in the audience have backed a project on Kickstarter? Great. I'm going to zoom right through this stuff. Uh, fundamentally, there's a few rules that everybody should be aware of. Uh, the first one is that you should be creating something that can be shared with others. Uh, the other thing is that it has to be honest and clearly presented. Honesty is a very big part of like how we uh, have created like a, a, an enthusiastic and careful community. For technology projects, that translates to having a clear and presentable prototype that shows how your project works. And also, you can't exactly fundraise for charity. Uh, sometimes fundraising uh, involves, um, like traditional fundraising involves fundraising for charity. That is not what our site is for. Our site is for sharing creative projects. And in addition, we have a list of uh, prohibited items. So for example, if you have a gun project, we are not the platform for you. So this is fundamentally like what a project page looks like. Uh, as you guys can see, this project has like uh, 93 backers so far. They've almost reached their goal, and they have four days left to go. Left to go. So within the next four days of this project, they they would have to raise about $950. Uh, a fundamental function of our site is that it's all or nothing funding, which means that when you set that goal in that previous project, the $5,000, if the goal is not reached, the backer the backers don't get charged and the creator does not receive any of the funds. Why is this? Because it works, and it works really well. It motivates everybody so that the creator is out there talking about their project and motivating people and explaining what it is and why it's so important to them. And backers are also motivated, and they're part of creating something and bringing it to life with the creator. And also, it's, a li it's less risky if the cost of tooling for your hardware is, let's say, $50,000. If you raise twenty, dollars it would be more difficult to actually get it done than it would if you if you just tried it again in a different way. Uh, let's not forget that the coolest cooler, as of a few days from now, the second biggest project on our site, uh, actually failed the first time that it came out as a project. Uh, it took another year of iteration and rethinking to make it so incredibly successful. Forty percent of their pro of our projects reached their funding goal. That's almost one in two projects. Uh, it's actually a tremendous statistic if you really think about it that almost uh, like 40% of everybody who comes up with a great idea on our site can actually deliver on that. And 17% of unsuccessful projects don't get a single pledge. Okay, here's what this actually means. It means that 17% of projects on our site don't put any effort or any communication into their project to the world. So their moms didn't back their project. And 79% of projects that raised more than 20% of their goal were successfully funded, which really means that there's a tipping point. Once you reach that 20%, usually in the early stages of a project, you have a very high likelihood, 80%, of completing and funding. And this is usually a, a something that I remind projects halfway through when they're at like 45 or 50% or 60%, and I say, you're almost there. We've seen the statistics. We've had 80,000 projects. You benefit from having this corpus of knowledge uh, that we can help you with. So keep this in mind as you start planning. 20% is a great number because it motivates you. So let's talk a little bit about. Oh, I managed. Oh, I managed, oh, I opened Outlook too. How many project creators do we have in the audience? I know the ones that are presenting later, but I'm curious, are there ones that I don't know here? Okay. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, I'm actually looking forward to, to meeting a bunch of creators uh, while I'm in France. Um, so the technology category on our site uh, has been very vibrant for a very long time. Uh, here we go. We've had more than five more than 5,700 successful projects with over $400 million pledged. And that's just since 2009. Um, some, some facts that I'm incredibly proud of. 25%, 25%, one in four products at the Eureka Park at CES uh, 
was was on Kickstarter at some point uh, in the early stages of the product. It's it's actually astounding. That's actually where I met the three D Sound Lab guys. Um, one out of every ten projects at Maker Fair. There's going to be a Paris Maker Fair uh, in May. You guys should definitely go. Maker Fair is a community that we've been attached to and been a part of for a very long time, and we've seen great projects come out of Maker Fair that became products that ended up in accelerators that went to Kickstarter and, and are now sold in stores. So you can start as somebody who is just an enthusiast, somebody who just tinkers on the side and just builds things in their workshop. And by sharing it with enough people, end up becoming like and end up having a new company and a new job. And we think that's a magical thing. It's it creates independence and it, it allows people to fulfill their vision. And Time named five of our projects in its top twenty-five best inventions of the year. Um, some interesting statistics: eighty-four thousand dollars is the average amount raised overall in technology and design. And 835 projects have raised more than $100,000. I actually really am really proud of that number because it means that if your project isn't in like the millions and millions of dollars raised, you still have a very high likelihood based on our community and based on our statistics of fundraising and moving to the next step in production and market. Um, some projects that have had great impact over the last, uh, over the last like year or so. Uh, Pebble is about to close. Uh, they're going to close probably at about $20 million or so. Uh, an astounding number. A lot of people said, well, why are they coming back to Kickstarter for their second watch? And to us, it was actually really simple. They're coming back for the community. They're coming back because it fits, it fits their narrative. It fits their ability to say, this is something that we want to experience again and bring it back to, to our core community. Sense is a uh, sleep tracking device. Uh, when Sense launched, they already had some VC funding, so they saw Kickstarter as an opportunity, not necessarily to raise funds for uh, going into production, but as a way of, of directly connecting with a core community of people that were going to be their first users. So sometimes when you're putting a product into the world, it's really useful to have a really tight feedback loop. So the first thousand, two thousand, five thousand users, it's really useful for them to be somebody that can tell you exactly why they're using it, how they're using it. And that's one of the fundamental things that, that Sense got out of their campaign. The Spark, the Spark platform was a, uh, an Internet of Things uh, connectivity platform that launched on our site uh, a couple years ago. And what we've seen, which is kind of amazing, is that since then, a lot of their users have also started developing their own products and have launched uh, 10 campaigns on our site so far. So in addition to being a, com a community where you can find backers, you can also find teams that can build upon your product as well and continue through their users to build your platform as well. And Max made a, a beautiful lamp called Lumio. A really interesting story about Max is that when I first met him, I asked him uh, who he was working with in China because I because I knew that his product was being manufactured in China, and he said no one. I went and I did it myself. He went and he built an entire supply chain by himself, which is amazing. He found the he integrated from uh, the purchasing of the Tyvek to the cutting of the Tyvek to the laser cutting of the wood, he sourced the LEDs, and he built his own supply chain by himself in China. I don't necessarily think that everybody should do that, but I think it's astounding that he could do it, and he chose to do it on, on completely his own terms. And a lot of this stuff, through our collaborations and through just uh, the sincere uh, beauty of, of some of these objects, have landed in, in places as, as awesome as the, uh, as the MoMA Design Store. We've had a couple of great collaborations with him. So you see actually the uh, uh, Max's lamp is over there and a few other uh, products from our site. Um, I'm going to pull back a little bit and talk about uh, the fundamental mechanisms and how creators look at our site. Ultimately, every project is a story. You go out there, you make something, you tell people how you made it, why you made it, and you bring along everybody for the journey. What it looks like on, on just on our website for your project page is that you have the project video, which acts as an invitation. You're basically saying, come in and take a look at what I've made. You have the rewards, which is what the, the monetary exchange is really based on. Uh, you might have a $25 award, a $100 award, and in exchange for the funds that backers give you, you give them something interesting. 
In our world, in product and tech and design, uh, it's actually a little bit easier because ultimately what we are creating is something tangible, something that you can hold in your hands. So that's usually the core reward. And we also have project updates, which is uh, how you continue to engage and communicate with your backers during the campaign as well as after the campaign. Uh, a great story. I once had a creator that launched his campaign four years ago. Two years after he launched his campaign, he put his product up for sale on Amazon. It's a, it's an Arduino controlled flashlight. So he put it for sale up, up on Amazon and he went to back to his original backers and he sent him an update and he said, I'm putting it on Amazon. You guys have already used it. If anybody wants to write a review, that would be great. Within a day, he had 40, four, either four or five star reviews, which is extremely powerful that two years later, all these people remembered who he, uh, who he was, remembered that they liked using this product and they immediately wrote these reviews. So he immediately had a presence on Amazon from zero. The project video should be short, it should be shareable, it should be personal. Sometimes you'll hear people say that, oh, you absolutely have to spend a large amount of money on the video. Sometimes that works. It's not necessary. We want to encourage and emphasize that independence and doing things on your terms is probably the greatest thing that you can do for a project video. Uh, a favorite of mine is uh, Makey Makey, which is a small little board that allows you to turn anything into a keyboard. If you guys watch the project video, it's the most lo-fi thing in the world because you can make a great video with just an iPhone. And that's what, that's what the creators of Makey Makey did. And they raised over $600,000 and they're an independent company that's still going strong. The project rewards, again, as I said before, a copy of the thing, a creative process, something that you can share with the experience. Uh, one of my favorite rewards uh, that I ever received was a, a piece of an early prototype. So it was uh, the project was uh, was for a, a musical keyboard, and they sent me a spring from one of their very first prototypes, which I think is like a fun little thing to have. It's a great story that you can tell people that this isn't just a spring. This is a spring from an early prototype of a device that was funded on Kickstarter that I helped create. Some stats as you're thinking about the rewards for your projects. $25 is the most common pledge. That's an easy way for people to pledge towards projects. Uh, five to seven reward tiers are ideal. Uh, on the top end, we top out at a, at a maximum of $10,000 for a reward. And that's the one where you usually see something, you know, a little bit ridiculous, a little bit amazing. Come and hang out with us in San Francisco. We'll give you a tour of the Bay Area and our factory is one that we see often. I mean, you guys live in France. If you offered the same thing, I think a lot of people would really love that. And also $100 is the tier that generates the most money. So uh, as you're thinking about how to structure your campaign to optimize for raising your entire goal, Keep in mind that $100 is an optimum price point. The project updates provide a very crucial and important function. They allow you to share really important moments. This is from Reading Rainbow. Uh, Reading Rainbow is a television was a television show in the United States for kids to learn how to read. And they relaunched it as a Kickstarter campaign. And it, be, it funded, like I think, within the first day. And the... The creator of the of the of the project is uh, is a, like a famous celebrity. He used to be in Star Trek, and he made like a really heartfelt video update, thanking everybody. Just like just really normal. Just took out his iPhone and recorded it. That's a great thing to be able to share with people. And you know, you can also do things like update people during the campaign. So, for example, on the one on the right, it was from somebody who was going to be at the Maker Fair, letting his backers know while the project was live that if they wanted to come and demo. Uh, the device that he would be available and in their vicinity. And sometimes you want to be able to update that you might have new rewards. So this is a project in which uh, Gloria Steinem uh, made a t-shirt for the project and it happened during the campaign. So it was a new reward that they wanted to let know, backers know about. And sometimes you want to let people know about things as they occur after the campaign. This is from Kano, a, uh, a Raspberry Pi based computer kit. Uh, when they were ready to ship this is how they told people that, that it was finally happening. So let's talk a little bit about backers. Backers are the people that, uh, you know, they provide money towards your project. They ask you questions. They're the first recipients and users of, of your product. I know that it's crowdfunding, but think of it more as a community. Think of it more as an extended family, a group of people that you care about as much as they care about you. That's 
thinking about backers in that way will ultimately lead you to a better design and lead you to a better relationship uh, with your first users. And I implore you guys uh, to check out our creator handbook. A lot of the things that I've talked about, uh, you'll find a little tips and little ideas uh, about how to approach these things there. There's a lot of wealth of information. And beyond that, uh, if you ever want to just search about Kickstarter, you'll find that a lot of creators have spent a lot of time writing blog posts, uh, even books and PDFs about their experiences and advice on how to do things. Uh, my email address is johnnykickstarter.com. You're all welcome to email me. I will answer emails probably at midnight or three in the morning. And I'm Dimarashi on Twitter. Uh, thank you all for having me. I'm open to any questions that you guys have. So actually, I'm, I'm going to ask you the first question, uh, and it's going to be a tough one, I have to tell you. Yeah. Uh, we have we have seen a lot of projects that have gone through Kickstarter um, that um, at some point felt difficult to get data from their pitch. We've seen competitors, Indiegogo or sort of self-started-like platforms, trying to help them on this part and trying to differentiate on, on this. So what are your plans on this part? Yeah. Could you clarify a little bit what was your Basically, a lot of people have the have the impression that they don't get as much data as they could get on if they were launching on their own platform. They don't get enough data on the number of views on their page, on the number of um, uh, views on their videos, mm -hmm. and 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 everything like that. Absolutely, that's a great question. The question really is like, how, what can Kickstarter do to start helping creators have a better experience in terms of understanding who's backing their project, why they're backing it, where they're coming from? As it stands right now, we do have a dashboard and you're able to see like on a very high level uh, where backers are coming from on the internet and what pledges they're backing for. But we can always do better. And I can definitely tell you that we're always working on stuff uh, over the next, over the next few months, over the next year, you'll see like really great things come out, come out of our product team. We take a very careful and conscientious approach to also protecting our, uh, our backer community. One of the reasons that we have such a great community of 8 million backers is because we make sure to protect things like their privacy and to make sure that, uh, when creators are communicating with them, that it's on, on a very, uh, sincere and honest level. That's not to say that like there aren't things that we can do better. We are always working on new things. So I think I think we'll see some great stuff come out uh, over the over the course of time uh, in terms of in terms of analytics. Um, beyond that, uh, I will also say that uh, no, that's pretty much it. Yeah, yeah. Other questions? I do. Um, on f wait, on what kind of projects? Uh, it actually okay. Yes. Over time, as projects get bigger, uh, what ends up happening is as they get a lot of public attention, our platform, because it's a global platform, the split starts to look like a fifty-fifty split. It tends towards that. So uh, it'll be for American projects. It tends to be fifty percent coming from the US and 50% coming from the, from the rest of the world. For French projects, I think that you'll see within the rest of the world, a much bigger percentage come from France. I think that's what you would expect. Uh, yes, sir. I don't have an exact date. It's within the next few months. Absolutely not. Come and, come and talk to me afterwards if you're working on a campaign right now. I'd love to talk to you. Yeah. We're doing a lot of great things, uh, and we're definitely focused on, on launching in France in the next few months. Uh, I'm here for the next week. I'm available to you guys if you guys want to chat about stuff. But also, my colleague, Julio Terra, who covers this stuff with me and specializes on wearables, will also be coming through in the next few weeks. Um, yeah. We want to make it a nice surprise. Yes, sir. Uh, 
So that's that's an interesting question. The question was, um, is there a, like a, a motivation or like a motivation to lower your goal in order to be able to reach it? That's it's something that is definitely possible. However, in the long run, uh, the best, smartest, and most responsible creators are the ones that realize that that's uh, that's not necessarily something that's going to help you, uh, because ultimately, money is something that you spend, and what you're left with after you spend it is either tooling, you're left with like fundamental infrastructure that you can use to uh, build your products. And you want to have the best products possible. So you always want to make sure that you're setting the goal at a reasonable amount that's really going to help you excel. Yes, sir. Um, are there projects that uh, gain funding and don't deliver? This is definitely something that uh, we think about and we look at. Uh, it's something that like we care about a lot. In the aggregate, uh, projects deliver. I think you'll you'll definitely meet a lot of people here that are working earnestly on uh, on delivering on their own projects. Uh, I don't have stats that I can share with you, but I can tell you that it's definitely something that like we think about a lot. And in the aggregate, uh, we like to encourage an honest and clear relationship between project creators and backers. Well, I mean, there's definitely like a, a financial relationship between the backer and the creator, and oftentimes uh, you'll see refunds happen between creators and backers. Ultimately, we encourage a, a clear and honest communication between creators and backers. Um, I'm friends with uh, with uh, a couple that produced a, 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 an aluminum extruded pen many years ago called Pen Type A, and it was one of the very early projects that uh, got a lot of attention, and it overfunded, and they had a lot of production problems. And I asked them once, what did you do? And they said, well, even though it was really, really difficult, we communicated with our backers every week. We told them every week what we were doing, how we were doing it, and why we were doing it. And ultimately, they were able over the course of time to fulfill and and have like a really great relationship with all of their backers. Yeah. All the way in the back. How do staff pick projects get chosen? Well, um, it's definitely something that, uh, I mean, I'm involved in that. Uh, it's something that uh, a large group of people at the office think about and talk about. We look at thousands of projects every day, and we try to find ones that are interesting, that have a lot of really great work that have gone into them, that share our values. When I said at the beginning that, that we're a platform for, for sharing your work with other people, that, that's the best way to make sure that it's staff picked. Uh, you know, it starts with like really basic things like making sure that you spent enough time to like have really great documentation, really great pictures of your project, uh, really well written text that describes it in a, in a, in an understandable way. Uh, and ultimately it comes down to making some tough decisions to make sure that, uh, great projects are shown globally, uh, to, uh, on Kickstarter. Number one, number two. So the question is, uh, what the if the currency display affects people's uh, perception and if if they back the project. And the truth is, we've seen we've been actually open in the UK for years now, and we've had huge projects come out of the UK, and theirs is displayed in sterling pound. Uh, I actually feel that uh, when we launch in Europe. Uh, the euro is so close to parity with the dollar, and there's such a really good understanding of what the euro is that I don't think it's actually going to affect it uh, to that extent. Uh, but there's, all, you know, we're thinking about this issue quite a bit. I think that there's some interesting things that we can do there. Uh, the gentleman, and then the gentleman. Thank you. Yes, sir.
So the question is, when is the right time to launch your campaign according to your prototype? This is my favorite question because there is no right answer. There's no right answer to this. You launch with the prototype that you feel comfortable sharing with the world. There are two ends of the spectrum. Let's say that you're working on an Arduino-based project and your prototype consists of an Arduino with some LEDs in it and some wires hanging out, but you feel comfortable telling the story of what this is, how it fits into people's lives, and showing some video of like people using it. Great, go for it, launch it. It's going to be hard, it's going to be a lot harder to really convince people that this is something that like they can really understand and fits in their life, because most people don't want a circuit board, right? That's one end of the spectrum. On the very other end of the spectrum, you have projects like Pebble who already have like a huge staff, they've done an incredible amount of industrial design, they've already costed down their bomb, they've done their DFM, great. That is the other end of the spectrum. There are so many points in between. One of my favorites is when teams have a really good works-like prototype and a really good looks-like prototype and a clear understanding through experience and advisors and consultation of what their timeline is going to be like to integrate those two. That's actually like my, just my personal favorite. Uh, the gentleman and then the other gentleman. Mm -hmm. Yes. Of course. This is definitely something that we're thinking about. Um, I don't know the exact plans of like how we're going to to deploy this, but uh, it's definitely something that like we know that like we have to consider in terms of like our international launches. We want you to be able to appeal equally to American creator, to American backers, and to French backers, and to global backers as well. I actually don't know. Um, well, my focus has been on France, guys, come on. Um, so I'm not 100% sure. Uh, I do know that, um, that we definitely have like a, it is definitely increasing, that much I know. Our global visibility, our, our, um, the projects that, that we see uh, in terms of uh, their, their appeal, uh, there's definitely like a larger audience coming from, 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 those, from that part of the world. If you have a project for that part of the world, I'd actually love to talk. I think that's really interesting. Yes, sir. Yes. Both of those questions are related. The first question for everybody else was, how do you rise above the crowd when you have thousands of projects on the site? That's a fair question. And the second question was, um, uh, how do you think about Kickstarter if you have a project that the demographic might not necessarily be there? So the answer to both of those is to have a really, really great product. I'm not kidding, because both of those on the first one, you will rise up if you have a great product. People will share it. People will tell each other about it. Take a look at print. There was no way that people were not going to notice print. It's too awesome. People want that experience. People, like older, older generations remember it, and they say, oh, wow, it's like Polaroid. And younger generations say, wait, that's a cool thing that I want to do with my friends because I like taking selfies. So both of those things, right? So there was no chance that they wouldn't rise up. It's because they took a lot of time developing a great product. Uh, and that will always, like, that will always be the core. Now there's a, there's a, there's an asterisk there. There's a side note, which is great documentation and a lot of documentation. You take a lot of pictures of whatever you're working on from a lot of different angles that are at high quality and you share them on social media, with press, on your website, with, uh, on your website, with updates during the campaign. The second question. We're fundamentally a neutral platform. If you feel that an audience isn't there, bring it. They will find it and they will have no hesitation of backing it. Um, I think personally, and I think personally that uh, our fashion category, our apparel category is very, very nascent. It's, 
It's still growing. Uh, it, we haven't even begin, begun to see the great stuff that's going to come in the fashion c- category. We have seen half million dollar projects. We've seen uh, $700,000 projects in things like jeans and shirts. But but wait until you start to see like a lot more uh, innovative and cool things happen in that category. You will see 40-year-old women back in projects and saying, yes, I've always wanted that thing. Let's make it happen. And I can have it in six months. That's awesome. How am I doing with time? We're good. We're good? Oh, awesome. Thank you very much, guys.